Are you ready to be in the spotlight? Are you ready to share your story with the world? Well, Snails with No Shells is where you need to be. Available on all digital platforms, Facebook, and YouTube. Snails with No Shells. Leave that shell at the door. Where did we go wrong? We were doing so Greetings, greetings, beautiful ones. I am Ms. BJ Martin, and this is Snails with No Shells. Leave that shell at the door. That's my only rule. All right, let's get into it. I would like to bring a very special guest to the stage. This is my friend, my teacher, my mentor, and so many more things. Professor James Small. Hi, Sister Brandy. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to Snails with No Shells. We appreciate you. No, I'm honored. I'm honored to be a part and to be a guest of your platform. Thank you so much. Hi. All right. So uh, in honor of Women's History Month, we're going to talk about the African woman as queen and king in African culture. That is our topic for tonight. But first, let me introduce Professor James Small to you. Professor James Small is a scholar, activist, a dynamic speaker, organizational consultant. He is also CEO of Sanaa Lodge Enterprise, Ghana LTD, CEO and president, African American Management Company, International Vice President, Organization of Afro-American Unity, Priest of Oya, Baba Larisha, Ifa Tradition, and past president of the Eastern Region of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. And that's just a little bit. That's just a little bit. For 11 years, Professor Small served as a principal bodyguard to the late Ella L. Collins, the sister of Malcolm X. And also much of his expertise is found in African American history and culture, Malcolm X, African traditional religions and the love for his people. I'm so honored to have you. Thank you again. And this is just, a, this is just a little bit. He has like two and three pages of his bio. So <laughs> well, I'll let you guys read that later. All right. So let's get into it. Professor Small, would you like to say something? No, just to thank you again, Miss Martin, and I hope you don't mind me calling you, you know, Randy. <laughs> no, <laughs> I do not. You can call me Brandy. That is my name. That's how yes. you know me. Yes, absolutely. So, so you want to get into the topic? Or yeah, that was, well, first. Well, first, let's let's I want to learn a little bit more about you, share some more things about you. OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So where were you born and raised? Yeah, I was born in uh, South Carolina, mm -hmm. um, a town called Georgetown, Georgetown County, one of the older towns on the eastern shore of what is now North America. Born and raised on a plantation, which was mm -hmm. called Arcadia, it was a conglomeration of 17 rice plantations. But my family don't come from those plantations. I happen to be blessed that one part of my family, the Austin, we are the Austins and Smalls, one part of them came from a plantation called Clifton and um, Forlorn Hope. And it's along the Waccamaw River in Georgetown. Um, but they were free people. They were not enslaved. They escaped from slavery in Virginia after about 16 years of slavery, and they lived free after that. The other side, the small smart of my family come from Ori, Georgetown, Marion County, where those three counties meet. That was called the Freewood. And they used to call us the Freewood N-word because that was our maroon community. And whites didn't really come up in there until the 1960s. 
throughout the 17th, 1800s, we live freely there. So I'm from that community, uh, the Smalls and the Austin, both free black communities. Um, my grandmother was a traditional priestess, so we call the root woman there. And so was my great grandfather. Um, so I tend to follow in that tradition. Um, so that's my home. I went to a one room classroom from first grade to seventh grade, taught by one teacher who taught all of the classes, one through seven in one room. And she passed away last May at the age of 98. And I okay. did get to go to a funeral, but we remained friends all of our lives. She was my second mother. Mm. Um, Betty Murray, the most extraordinary teacher in the world. Um, and then I went to an all black high school in Georgetown. I never had a white teacher until I was an adult and went to the US Navy and then okay. City College of New York. So I come from this coarse Gullah, Geechee, Rice Belt, African background with our um, Gene Poole coming out of Congo, Angola, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Ghana. You know. Wow. That's what makes up that Gullah Geechee mm -hmm. merging of all of those ethnic nations I just mentioned. Wow. Oh, so much history. Oh my gosh. And you grew up in it. Yeah. I'm wow. a proud of it. Okay, so I was going to ask you, what was it like growing up? I mean, people, we lived on a plantation in an African village. That was not different from many of the villages you'll find in Africa today. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing. We fished for a living. Um, we hunt. Mm -hmm. We farmed. Um, we ate much of the same food we ate in Africa, prepared pretty much the same way. Mm -hmm. They had jollof rice. We had red rice. It was the same jollof rice. Yes. Um, they had yams. We had red and white sweet potato yams. And, you know, yes. um, the way they use, um, when they made their fufu, we called it dumpling, you know. Oh, um, okay. We, 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 we were Africans. People keep saying, oh, we lost everything. No, we didn't. You know, no, we didn't. If you just look at the people who have stood as, as freedom fighters from Fannie Lou Hamer to Dr. King to Malcolm, all of the families came out of that African South. And we always resisted tyranny wherever mm -hmm. we were, mm -hmm. you know? So um, that's my foundation. The people I know, I remember when we started in the 60s when I was about 15, that's when I could say I was formally in the movement. Of course, if you're black in the South, mm -hmm. you're born into the movement because if you don't, be smart and resist the tyranny, you can end up killed along a highway, along the street, in okay. the woods, you know, and people mm -hmm. would get away with it. So your whole life, like my 15th birthday was a 22 rifle as a gift. Wow. Down. My 16th birthday, because I'm going to town to go into Georgetown City to go to high school. And when I played football, I had to hitch a ride across two rivers to get home. My gift was a two shot Derringer. 22 hmm. short, because they understand you out there in the world, you're going to have to take care of some business if stuff went down wrong. And I did have stuff go down wrong with me, mm -hmm. where people tried to kill me and chase me through the marsh in the middle of the night. And I had to save my life by firing that one then danger mm -hmm. in the air. Mm -hmm. So that scared them enough. They didn't come any deeper into the marshland. And I was able to escape the next morning, just barely. But that was not unusual if you lived in a terrorist South at that time. But when we were picketing the Woolworth in Georgetown and the Strand Theater and the Palace Theater for the segregation behavior, our parents didn't want us to do that. Those of us who were from the plantation, they said, we ain't begging them to be a part of their thing. So they made our church our movie theater. Okay. So every Wednesday night, we can go and watch the same movies at mm -hmm. our church that they were watching in the theater in town on Saturday and Fridays. You know, So that kind mm -hmm. of resistance movement I grew up in. Um, I remember there was a store, Flagler's. It was about two blocks from our high school. And I played football on the football team of Howard High. And what, what and position did you play? I was a halfback. I was a running back and a okay. receiver as well. Okay. But this man that owned this grocery store was the only white grocery store in the black neighborhood. 
pull a gun on a young man over a loaf of bread. And we were on the football field, 44 of us practicing, and we heard this. And I I can still remember 44 cliques on that um, <laughs> asphalt. It sounded like horses, right? <laughs> and we went to that store and we tore it apart. It never was able to open again, and he had to sell the property and get um. out of our community. Because the next day, our mother set up a picket line around it because we were together like that. Yes. So um, hmm. that's the foundation I come out of. When I was 16 years old, I saw Malcolm X on television. My mother and father had moved to New York two years before to find better work to make you know more money for the kids and, and, and my grandparents. And we stayed in the South with our grandparents. Hmm. And um, I saw this man. And I just loved them. So I called my mother and asked, could she bring me to New York to meet him? Which mm -hmm. my mother did. So at 16 years old, I met Malcolm X on 141st Street in front of the food family supermarket while I was packing groceries in those days. He had bag packets back then, right? And uh, my life was never the same after that. You know? Malcolm mm. was like my family. I don't put Malcolm ahead of my mother, my father, my grandparents, and what they taught me about resistance and movement, but Malcolm was certainly a big impetus in what happened for the rest of my life. You know, at some point I would become the imam over his mosque after his assassination when I was at age 21. So Really? 21? Uh, yeah, 21. I was a big time imam. A few years later, I went to Mecca before most black Americans, no matter how big their station was, went to Mecca. Okay, question. I, Professor Small, what does e man mean? What does that mean? That's a, a Muslim minister. You know, I was the minister over the Muslim Mosque Inc. The okay. title is called e man. There shouldn't be any ministers in Islam. The e man is supposed to be someone who leads you into prayer, not act as clergy. There's not supposed to be any clergy in, in Islam, according to the teachings of Quran and Hadith. But somehow they've created a clergy. There's not supposed to be a holy day. There's no Sabbath in Islam. But yet they've created, they've allowed the Western world to make them create Friday as the Muslim Sabbath day. There is no Muslim Sabbath day. Mm. But those are the, the corruptions that have come into uh, ancient teachings, um, trying to get people to live a rightful life, you know? Okay. Um, but that's just some of my history. You know, I was just on another webinar before this with one of my great brothers. His name is Deruba Ben Wahat. Mm -hmm. um, um, a giant in the revolution of the 60s and 70s, went to prison for nearly two decades for crimes he didn't commit mm. um, as a part of the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of people, I remember there was an incident where he was attacked down in Georgia, but those people don't understand, mm -hmm. you don't attack your icons. Mm. That's arrogance and evil mm -hmm. and pretending to be revolutionaries. Mm -hmm. And anybody want to challenge me that you don't want to challenge me, you know? And so I was with Deruba Ben Wahad, who lives in Ghana now, but he's back in the States. Um, and I was very happy to see and be on a program with my brother. He's one of the most brilliant political minds around. Mm -hmm. um, had the, one of the best analysis on Pan-Africanism I've ever seen. Um, and it was just good to be with him, as I am happy to be with my young sister, um, Brandy, you know? Yes. Wow. Oh, okay. 21. Wow. That's, that's a major responsibility. I think at a 21 year old today. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had counselors now. I had people who advised me and I had a mm -hmm. council of elders and I had soldiers and I had an army and I had bodyguards and I had mm -hmm. all the things that go with trying to show people a direction in a forest of criminals, pretending some to be black, pretending some to be democratic, pretending some to be human. When the last thing they wanna see is a free black population who can self-determine their lives for themselves. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Okay, so, when, how, um, so you said you were in the military. How old were you when you went to the military? 17. Okay, so this is before, okay. Before, after I met Malcolm, but before when Malcolm was killed while I was in the military. In what branch? I was in the Navy. Okay. I was a librarian for much of the time, mm -hmm. believe it or not. 
Um, I believe so it. They didn't make a movie about the librarian. Yeah. <laughs> they did make a movie about the librarian. Yeah, well, it wasn't Professor James Small in the library. That would be a totally different movie. But it was a good learning experience. If I had my brothers today, every young Black man stepping out of high school would go in the military for two years. And don't tell me about it's the white man military, but while you're living in the white man country, if you're going to go there. So don't mm -hmm. go there because you can't justify one and then deface the other, you know? Okay. And I think if you went in the military, you wouldn't be in the penitentiary in the numbers you're in. You wouldn't be selling dro drugs, murdering your people and trying to justify it by saying you don't have a job. You wouldn't be killing 3,000 black women and children in the streets of America in a five year period of time mm. and calling yourself a man. I think that two years in the military, since you don't have any training force of your own, the closest we have is the nation of Islam and you don't want to become a Muslim and they haven't figured out how to use that training for non-Muslims, then go someplace where you can get that training, mm -hmm. come out, you have money for college, come out, you can get the head of the civil service line for police, fire department and, and sanitation and other things and there are other benefits. And it beats what you got to offer yourself now or what the black community got to offer you. I went in the military, didn't change me. No one can say they put as much in the black struggle as I have. Mm -hmm. It didn't change my father, who put me in the struggle. Didn't change my big brothers who served in the Korean War and my uncle who served in the Second World War and my great uncle who served in the First World War. And they were all community people. They were all race men. They all stood up and fought for our people, mm -hmm. either from the bases of the NACP or from the bases of the Freemasonry or the, the Knights of Pythias or the Odd Fellows and the women and the daughters of the Ruth and the daughters of Isis and the mm -hmm. Tent. These are all black organizations that my family belong to and many of your family belong to and you probably don't even know about. That was fighting for us before there was a Martin Luther King, before there was a Malcolm X. Mm. That's why we need to study our history so we can erase the myth and mysteries of others. Mm -hmm. mm, I love that. So you basically saying we need some, we need something, we need some discipline. We need more, we need something to discipline us, more order and discipline. Well, because there's nothing else there. Mm -hmm. If we had control of our community, but you don't have control of your community when those of us who are working and most of us are working and got job and we spend over a trillion dollars a year but we spend it with people who run our community the grocery stores is run by a foreigner to our community the laundromat is a foreigner to our community the dry cleaners is a foreigner to our community most restaurants are foreigners to our community they take that money at the end of the day they don't they don't invest a penny of it back in the community they rarely hire our people they import their own people to work in their businesses and at the end of the day, they take that money to the part of town they live in and invest it. That's called colonialism mm. anywhere else in the world. And mm. if you don't have the wherewithal to break that colonialism, then you should go where you should get the wherewithal. You've already proven you can't shoot a gun straight because you're killing babies in the streets every day. You're killing our women in the streets every day. Claiming you're shooting at your enemy who's your brother, who you should be sitting with and planning how to economically, politically, and culturally take control of this neighborhood. But you can't do that if you don't have a clear educational understanding, intellectual understanding of what economic politics and culture is and does in a community. And I'm saying the military would give you some heads up and give you some time to develop and discipline from the adolescent into manhood. Yes. And you can't tell me all this fluff about I don't want to go to war. You're living in war every day. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. are getting killed in our community every day. And you can't stop it because you're not trained, skilled, or tooled to stop it. Right. And you don't have the institution to train, skill, or tool you. So go to the, go to the, to, don't tell me, I don't want to be in the white man army. You're in the white man country. Stop the foolishness. <laughs> stop the mm. foolishness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you want to change it, then use every tool available mm -hmm. in the society to give you the skills and the strength to change the white man and all the other groups that come into America as immigrants. And the first place they come is to exploit the black underdog. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. There's base capital. While calling themselves our friends, your friends don't rob you and exploit you and smile in your face and then take the money and the wealth and go somewhere in town where you can't even go to visit. They see you in the neighborhood, they call the police on you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this ain't all white folks. Some of them are the same color as us. They speak a different language, practice a different religion, but yes. what's real is real. Know the truth, the truth should set you free. Mm. Live the lie and you'll surely die. Mm. Y'all heard it. <laughs> <laughs> I do those little things, you know. But Y'all true. heard it from the master teacher. Hey, take notes. Take notes. And I, I agree. I mean, I, look, I, I agree. I do it because I've often felt like, because um, when I was substitute teaching and I was in, 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 I often felt like after your senior year, didn't having children, senior year, I felt like school should be a couple more years. I did feel like that because I'm like, they're not, they're not ready. They, these are 17 year old, 18 year old. This is just my opinion. Mm-hmm. 17 year old, 18 year old babies. Um, yeah. And I felt like they're not ready yet. They need a couple of more yeah. years of getting some trade schools uh, learning in. Or- well, there was no apprenticeship for trade schools in our community. There's no rights of plastic program in our community. Mm-hmm. And let's use the tools that's there. They have a military. Let's mm-hmm. use that as our rights of passage. Mm-hmm. All right. And the military, there's multiple skills you can get trained in. Everything from computer design to um, electronics to radio to radar to 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 welding to electronic communications there's all kinds of skills that's there they don't hire civilians to run the military they teach this to people who are in the military okay. and then you can convert that skill when you come out of the military plus you have so many other opportunities unless you got another pathway don't be fighting me I'm offering you a pathway that's there. You look at the Latino community, how they've come to America in the last 30 years and used the military to take themselves up. One generation, they're on the bottom getting getting below poverty wages, which puts you out of a job. And the next generation, their kids are graduating from colleges. Mm-hmm. You know, and the ones who didn't go to college, go to the military to get the money for colleges. And we sit around on the street corner trying to, many of us, not all of us, trying to figure out which poison we're going to sell our people today to make a few dollars to buy some sneakers. Mm. Okay. Let's stop lying. Let's get real. We're not going to save ourselves by killing ourselves and trying to justify it by saying somebody treated you bad. Yeah, they treated you bad. So what you going to do about it? Treat yourself worse. Mm. Hmm? What are you going to do? And for those who do have opportunities. Those who call themselves clergy and minister in our community, when are you going to come and minister to the people who need you? Mm. And not the ones you can just get a bucket full of money from. And call yourself the disciples of Christ, the apostles of Christ. Give me a break. Stop lying. Stop lying. I read the Bible as well as anybody else, better than most people, actually. Mm. So whose servant are you? You mm. big a mega ch- build a mega church, but all of the bells and whistles on the bulk of your people are living in poverty, and you still take their money so you can live in the upper crust communities of Atlanta and New York and Philadelphia and Maryland, and then say you serve in Christ. If you were serving Christ, you'd have a tent in the ghetto mm. around barefoot with a robe on. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. But don't tell me about your Learjet and your Rolls Royce and God wanted me to make money. Stop lying before the people wake up and turn on you in the worst way. Mm. You know, you can't, some of you can't even get your gender questions straight in how you're teaching the masses. Mm-hmm. Um, no disrespect to nobody who got their belief, have your belief, but guess what? I got mine. Yes. And it may be very different from yours. Mm-hmm. I love all my brothers and sisters. We all crippled and bent and broken and shattered in some way by this white supremacist racist we've been under for almost 400 years now. But we should want to heal and want to get better. Yes. And want to be restored to what we were before we met these sick people. Mm. 
And then now we tell them that we can't even call the people who murder you murderers. But nobody tell the Jews they can't call the Nazis Nazis. Okay, but they want to tell us, oh, you can't call a racist racist because I didn't do it. My parents did it. Well, you tell those that stuff to the Jews and see what you be called. <laughs> You'll be anti-Semitic in every media in the country. You lose your job, your chance in school, and et cetera, et cetera. But me, my murderer, I'm supposed to marry them. My rapist, I'm supposed to have built a family with them. You know. And yes, they're they're I I'm not against forgiveness, but I'm against facing reality. If I've got to suffer from slavery, then you gotta take responsibility for slavery. Otherwise, relieve my suffering. Hmm. I've got to suffer. If I gotta be the result of it, then you also the result of it. And if you have inheritance and opportunities and things that came from my dying, then you got to take responsibility for that. <clears throat> and at least let's have a conversation. Now y'all have gotten so sick, you don't even have a conversation in school calling it critical race theory. You don't need no critical race theory. All we need is true American history. Tell the story about what America was, is, and have done. And ain't even trying to make themselves better. Because we still see the same people treating black people the same way. Mm -hmm. And the newest generations of seven, eight, nine-year-old children, they're no better in their behavior than those in the generation before me. So what's going wrong? If you can't educate them in the home, then let's try to educate them in the schools. But you don't want to educate them in the schools because you figure you want to keep the heads many. You want to stay in power. You don't want to stop being prejudiced against Black folks. You don't want to stop discrimination against Black folks because that challenges your hegemony where somebody could compete with you for jobs and compete with you for opportunity and can compete with you in education on an even platform. You don't want that. You pretend you want that, you know? You wanna make me seem like a welfare recipient when you've always been the largest number of people on welfare. You wanna say food stamps is my income medium when you, the white community, is the largest receiver of food stamps. White women particularly are the largest receiver of um, affirmative action. So why are you gonna dump that at my doorstep when you wanna defame me, when you're the one that's taken all this government money and not me? Mm -hmm. You know, and you're able to train your children to come back and be my teachers without training them how to be human beings towards me. And so they cripple another generation of black folks they're scared of, they don't know, and they don't care about. And call it schooling because they pass you a piece of paper that's meaningless and you have no skills and can't get no jobs. Mm. Right. Let's come back to you. I don't want to take you off your crown. You're listening. <laughs> your you know? And I hope Atlanta's hearing me because a lot of our people in the middle class in Atlanta is down there and pretending that they made it without the sacrifice of the people of the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Well, you only made it because the rest of us sacrificed. Mm. So you got a responsibility black Atlanta middle class, not to run away from those who are in need, but to find out how to give service, especially when you call yourselves Christians. And even those of you who are Muslims, if I don't cover my head with the right kind of kufi, and my woman ain't covering her face up like God scared to see the woman face or something, you, you can't deal with me. Mm -hmm. If I don't say salam alaikum, if I say peace and blessings, then you want me to say, use a, why would I use a foreign language to say something I want you to understand. But it's with that. Mm. We speak English, you know. Yes. And for those who would impose Christ, Christ is a beautiful thing. I love Christ too, but I understand Christ. But if I said voodoo, you wanted to fame me, yet my great great grandmother didn't know Christ. She know voodoo as the mm -hmm. name of God mm -hmm. in her native language of Fan or Ewe. And the word voodoo for the ignorant, especially the ignorant clergy, the word means the essence of the divine within. Mm. The essence of the divine within. Okay. You wear a cross, a symbol of the death of your leader, but you get upset if I wear beads with colors of philosophical interpretation of how one should practice 
principles, concepts, and ideas that are godly and human. So mm -hmm. let's be. Um, I'm the, your brother. I grew right up in America. I grew up in the South. I've been married 51 years. I've raised six kids, 23 grandkids, and a whole bunch of God kids. 90% of them have made it through life without any destructive things happening to them. You know, some haven't, because of course, any group, somebody's not gonna listen to the regulation and the rules, and they're gonna step on out there and some stuff they can't control. But for the most part, African-American people have been good law-abiding people in the United States of America. For the most part, we've done as much, if not more, to build America as any other people ever in the history of America. For the most part, we've fought in every war this nation has ever had from its revolutionary war to present, and were heroes and heroines in that fighting, even while there were shackles on our ankles and our hands. So stop playing us cheap and marginalizing us, you know? Because I'll slip back down into Plato, you know, Plato, the Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wrote a book, you know, they like to give us the Republic when we go to college. Oh yeah, I went to college, but I'm still from the hood, from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. you know? And we got the Republic written by Aristotle about Plato. But Plato wrote a beautiful piece called the Phaedrus, P-H-E-D-R-U-S. And guess what he had to say? Now, this is Mr. Plato. He's a big man. He's a philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, boy, top of his food chain when it comes to philosophy. And he says the Ethiopian, meaning Black people, meaning African people, gave the world all of its sciences. Then he names it. He said the African gave the world arithmetic. The African gave the world geometry. The African gave the world medicine. The African gave the world, he names astronomy. And he said, the greatest science of all, this is Plato now, the big man, the mm -hmm. monk at the top of the food chain of Western philosophers. He said, the greatest science of all the Africans gave to the world is the science of writing itself. Mm -hmm. so don't be playing with me and my people. We didn't come out of no jungles. We didn't burn monkeys hanging in trees. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not a bunch of poverty, rich children that flies around our mouth. Let me just read something. I didn't plan on putting ahead this or something else, but just listen to this. Okay. Somalia. We always hear about Somalia, right? Okay. And we hear about Mogadishu and Black Hawk Down. But what is your Black Hawk doing in my Somalia anyway? We should shoot them down. But why are they in Somalia? Somalia has uranium. Somalia have iron ore. Somalia have tin. Somalia have gypsum. Somalia have bauxite. That's where you make aluminum from. Somalia have copper. Somalia have an abundance of salt. Somalia have natural gases. And Somalia have oil. So why are they in poverty? Because somebody's got your military and they're killing off the rightful leaders and won't let us organize our own natural resources because you want to steal it. And when you undevelop our country, then you say we're in poverty. How can we be in poverty with all that wealth? Right. Would you dump it in your ships every day, taking it away without paying us what you should pay us for it? We go to Cameroon and the news don't cover none of these wars. They in Russia and this business going on in Europe. But these wars have been going on since the 1990s. One's been going on since the 1950s. Mm -hmm. Cameroon. Cameroon have crude oil, timber, cocoa, aluminum, cotton, bananas, coffee. Somebody wanted it and they don't want to pay us for it. So they got us fighting each other while they steal it. Mm. Then we go to the Congo. In the last 10 years, we lost 5 million people. 5 million people in the last 10, 12 years. You heard it on the news? Millions of women get raped every day. Millions of them. Do you hear it on the news? No. Because Congo have diamonds, gold, copper, cobalt, cassonite, tin, coltan to make cell phones, oil, and timber. So while they keep us fighting in Congo and not able to build hospitals and school with all this wealth, they're loading their trucks with the wealth and they build freeways that go from the mine straight to the port and the airport and they take it out of our country. Mm. 
So I say to my beautiful black audience who are listening to us, learn your history and you'll erase the mystery of your enemy. The mystery and the myth they use to define you. We've got more young black people in prison today than we had in slavery mm. at the end of the Civil War. A little more than half. Slavery at the end of the Civil War, we had about two million and some change in prison and on parole. Right now, we got about two million people. So we mm. got the same amount of people in slavery then that we have now. We control the same amount of wealth now that we did then. We actually control more wealth then than we do now. Oprah and some of the billionaires, the millionaires, what we're standing, they weren't the first billionaires or millionaires. Game people play with the mind. Mm -hmm. But being a billionaire and siding with the enemy of your people don't give you any value. I'm not saying this about Oprah. I love Sister Oprah. And I love what some of the ball players are doing and sending children to college and building things in our community. I'm proud of my people. Mm -hmm. There's some extraordinary people who are up against some great odds. But I want us to know that we got many more that we never hear about that do great things in our community that we never talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I criticize the church. It's, it deserves, the church leadership deserves criticism in America, especially today. Because there was a time the people, when they build those churches, they built their African spiritual sanctuary in the church because that was the only place that they had sanctuary. Okay, and all of our movements were led by those people. Now um, we don't see that. Where where are the Dr. Kings? Where's the SCLC? You know, where are those people who say those people who are on the streets and homeless is my responsibility? Where are those people who said those people who are unemployed is my responsibility? Mm -hmm. Where are those people who said that those people who working but not even making enough money working to keep food on their table or pay the rent are my responsibility. Yet you are living in opulence off of the money they put in that pan every Sunday. More money is raised in the black community by black people on Sundays than any other day of the week. And less of that money come back to black people than the money that comes from white people. Y'all figure it out. Y'all know I'm not lying now. I ain't got to be abusive. I'm just knowing the truth. The truth shall set you free. Truth alone shall set you free. If you're a servant of the great one, who God sent at his own son, let's act like you're going to imitate him. And that's not putting you down. That's giving you an opportunity to raise yourself up. Mm -hmm. But anyway, Sister Martin, one, one of you, I know you got some questions of me that you want to ask. And you know, at nine fifteen, I got another program. Yeah, I know, it, I know it. But you know, this, hey, this is you giving some these good nuggets coming out. This is, I, you know, and I'm gonna let you go, let you flow because we need to know this, you know. So, okay, so uh, back to I had a question I wanted to ask you because we're talking about speaking about women, right? This is women. Mm -hmm. History Month, I was going to ask you, were, you know, were there a lot of women in the movement? That was going to be one of my questions. And then kind of segue into our topic about um, African women um, as queens and kings in African culture. Well, in the movement of mm -hmm. the 60s, 70s, late 50s, 60s, and 70s, women were either equal to or the majority of men. But Africa has always had a tradition that we continue right over here. Women carry the power. Men carry the authority. But it is the women that give that authority to the men. If you go back as far as ancient Egypt, you'll see a statue of Isis. And she always has a stool or chair on her head. The chair is the symbol of power. But it is the woman that always sat the man in that chair as a symbol of authority, but the authority is granted to the man by the power, which is the woman in African culture. Because women aren't trying to be men and men aren't trying to be women. They understand nature made that decision when it created us. And so we're trying to fulfill the role that nature created 
us to be. And so power is the ability to define your reality and have other people accept your definition mm -hmm. as if it were their own. And when you define your reality, it means you carry out the socialization process of your community. And socialization is how the children get their values, interests, and principle. The women do that for the most part in an African community. Mm. When women do that in most communities, so when you want to look at a people, look at what their women are teaching them. And that tells you what's going on in the community. And so in ancient Africa, you had the woman as the power, the men as authority, granted authority by the women who hold power because the women control the institutionalization and distribution of the wisdom that they give the man the authority to develop from the study of cosmology and ecology. Mm -hmm. And so when we study our history, like I say, you erase other people's myth and mystery and get a true sense of what your people was before people came with guns and sword and murdered us, burnt our societies down, stole our people and our wealth. You go in the Museum of Europe now, from Germany to Spain to Britain to France to Finland to Russia. And if you take everything African that they've stolen out of those museums, they don't only need one building to house their own bunch of crap. And all of that wealth of Africa that sits in the museum that says, oh, well, we didn't steal it. Uh, we bought it from this king and that bull. And then it's, but we set up a situation where we can take care of it better than you can. And it'll always be available for you to come and see. But they don't mm -hmm. tell you that they've monetized all of that and use it as a collateral as a part of their state capital or NDP, you know? Like we can't build museum. Let us have our control of our own wealth. Get your CIA and your MI5 and your MI6 and French intelligence and your Israeli Mossad out of Africa. Stop murdering off our good leaders. And let us build the societies we want to see for our children. Mm -hmm. But you murder the best we've got, then come up with propaganda machinery and try to blame it on ourselves. It's like you dumped the drugs and the crack in our community back in the 80s and blame it on us. We don't have no airplanes. We don't have no cocoa farms in, in South America. We don't have no banks laundering the money, but you blame us. And then we have a president. He's probably a nice man, but he created the, the three strikes and the outlaw that put more people in prison in, in the 10 years of Biden, not Biden, what's his called name, uh, Clinton and Obama, Biden's bill put more black people in slavery in that period, of, in, in jail in that period of time than was in slavery mm -hmm. for any given time in the history of America and did more to destroy their lives than slavery ever did. Mm -hmm. When you come out of prison, you still, you're a felon, mm -hmm. you can't get a job, can't live in public housing, mm -hmm. you, um, you, 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 you just, you lose your citizenship completely. It's like the 13th mm -hmm. Amendment says slavery is abolished except for those committed of a, of a felony. And so the way we put black people into slavery, we felonize them. And we take millions of black men off of the bogus roll in any given set of years. And if you keep a person off the bogus rolls between 18 and 25, the chances are they're never gonna vote. You know, mm. and if you 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 take and you felonize millions of young black men, they're not going to be able to become postal workers, policemen, or firemen. So you move all that competition out of your children's way. Mm. People who say they love people and they love God, but they're not willing to face the truth. They're not willing to mm. face to know the truth is to set yourself free. But I know Sister Brandy, my dear Sister Martin, we just have begun to do this thing and I'm gonna have to be gone in a minute, girl. Oh know. my goodness. So you know, I mean, you, you're gonna have to come back. You, you're I'll gonna be have happy to come you. back. And my daughter, my sister, my friend, my student for quite a while.
Yes. If anytime you ask me in, I'll be happy, more than happy to come back. Um, and even bring some of my friends, bring the doctors. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to sit and talk to you about history, about culture, about the crisis we're facing, about economics, about politics. You know, mm -hmm. we need the people in the political office, but we need people whose loyalty is not to the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but their loyalty should be to the Black communities who vote, elect, and put them there. You know, we elect people to office and nothing changed in our community because all of a sudden their loyalty is to hanging out with the gang of four or whatever these foolish people call themselves. Mm -hmm. And we elect Muslim sisters and from the Midwest and they talk about the Muslim interests in the Middle East and here and then, but I haven't heard one word from them about the black interest in the community of black people who elect them there, sent them to Washington. Mm -hmm. So they better be careful because some of us have very strong voices in the next election, we may come out against some of them. So mm -hmm. they better get it right because there's a time for change now. And we can no longer be pimped by people because they look attractive or they look mm -hmm. handsome or they got a degree um, or they can be raised in a white community by racist white people, but marry a black woman and marry a black man. And so now all of a sudden you are a leader because it's really weird that almost every significant person that have been brought into the Biden administration is married to someone from another race. What's that about? you know, the new judge, the head of the military or the whatever the big black man's job is, mm -hmm. the vice president. Uh, what is that about? That you can only get one of these positions if you're in, in a mixed marriage situation? Is that's what we're being told? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm just making an observation. I'm not condemning it. People love who they love. Mm -hmm. But um, I need to understand if you say you rec mm -hmm. you're representing me, and that representation must reflect me, mm -hmm. you know, stop playing with black people. And then as we get near the end, um, let me just tell this person, I'll be back. Um, stop calling me people of color. Every three years when you want to do some maneuver to take power and resources from black people, you change our name. Back in the 60s, we were called Negroes. And we fought as Negroes under the leadership of the Malcolm X, the Elijah Muhammad, the Dr. King, the Matt Gabbers, the Fannie Lou Hamers, the Rosa Parks. We fought as Negroes to get certain rights and privileges. And when we got them, in the middle of signing the document, you changed our name from Negroes to minority. Then you made um, disabled people minority, white women minority, other people from of color from other countries in the world, minorities, and all that we fought for got distributed to everybody and only pittance of it got to the black people who fought for it. Because you changed my name. And so we fought to then have ourselves called blacks and then have ourselves called African-Americans. And we arrived at that to tie ourselves back into our motherland, our mother birth culture. And now you want to call us people of color. I'm not a people of color, I'm an African. That shows me and I've chosen it. And don't tell me about my brown skin or tell me about BJ Martin's brown skin. We were brown before we left Africa. We came in all brown ain't nothing but a shade of black, okay? And you can go all over Africa with no white man but you still see brown people. So don't play. Yes, we have people that get black, as black as this object. And we have people as brown as Sister Martin. So stop trying now because you want to now, you got to build some Asian people got beat up over the last few years. And nobody should touch any one of our Asian brothers and sisters or try to harm them in any way, except in self-defense. And I haven't seen much of self-defense. They've been abusing, misusing old people and others, whites and blacks, and they should be paid for it. But how do you get an Asian hate bill passed with Congress like that? And all the bills concerning blacks' rights and black protection is still stuck in Congress. Yet we are, our numbers are uh, at least five to 10 times that of the Asian community in America. And we've contributed to this country centuries longer than any other group in America. Mm -hmm. 
but you can get an Asian bill passed in two weeks to protect them. Yet black people are killed and mutilated and beaten every day in this country and our women are disappearing. We can't find them all over this country every day and we can't get any kind of bill passed for our protection. And I'm talking to the black folks now who are masquerading in Washington DC now calling themselves people of color because if they call themselves black, they got to take responsibility for things in the black community. If they call themselves African-American, they got to take responsibility. So now they'll be people of color. So they don't really have to take responsibility because then got scattered all over the place. Mm. So we need to wake up, smell the coffee, stop betraying our people. You know, I'm not interested in the kind of suit you wear, the kind of shoes you got on and where you live. I'm interested in if you ask me for my vote, you're going to serve me for having voted for you. And if you don't serve me, I'm begging black people, give them one term and vote them out of office. I don't care who it is. Because if you don't vote them out of office, they're going to play you and work as collaborators with your enemy, come and lie to you at election time and go back and play you and work as collaborators with your enemy while you and your children suffer. And nothing changes. So, Sister Martin, I know I'm going to have to leave you soon, so I'm going to let you take over. <laughs> Put the bow on it. Okay. You know, so. All right. Because, right, I was going to say, well, um, you know, did you have just like maybe an encouraging word, especially to women, since it is our month? Right. Well, the, the, the women, listen, if we study history, if we study genealogy and paleontology, and we look at this Y, 2, 3, and the chromosome war, the oldest being on earth is a woman. I still hear some fools trying to rationalize the first being being a man. Well, his penis is not big enough to give birth to children. Okay. Then they're going to ask the question, well, how did the woman get impregnated? Maybe she came pregnant. You say you believe in God and God could do anything, but you don't believe God that can impregnate a woman. Mm. You know? Because you don't understand nature, you don't understand God. God is everything and all things at once. God isn't some man standing up in the sky looking at things, it's me. Everything that exists has God as an aspect of it or as an aspect of God. I think in the African books, which is older than any of your books called the Pyramid Text, when God had created all the world, he looked around and said, I created everything my heart desired and then I expanded in it. And so women, you're the foundation of the world. That's why you carried a stool on your head. The stool is symbolic of the foundation of society. You're the power that give authority to us men. Without your power, we have no authority. You know, we have in Africa from the beginning of time, women who were kings and women who were queens. Now, men can be no queen, thank God, and but women can be kings. One of the earliest famous ones is Hatshepsut in early Egypt, what they call a pharaoh or king, she was the king. And then we had Nzenga of Angola, she was a king. And even today we have Queen Diambi of Congo, who's king of all of the Congo. It has nothing to do with gender, it has to do with authority the authority given. When there's no man worthy of the authority, then the woman who has the power can put a woman in there to carry that authority. And we've done that numerous times through our history. Amanatu in early Nigeria, you know, the queen of the people called them Moors, but they never called themselves Moors. They were the Gudamas of North Africa and the Karamantes of North Africa, before the Arabs came, or the Germans came, or the Romans came and lightened them up through tyranny and colonialism. So study history, it will erase the myth and the mystery and allow you to get control of economic politics and culture in the communities you live in. So you can provide the food, clothing and shelter yourself and your family 
and get control of land, labor, and resource as a result. And then you don't have to beg nobody else for nothing. So my sister Brandy. Yes, thank you again, Professor Small, for coming to Snails with No Shells. We love you. We appreciate you very yep. much. To coming again. Yes, you will. <laughs> my dear. And before we go, I just want to say one thing, my word to everyone, I always say this, remember, just like the sun, you are necessary. I love y'all. Peace and blessings.